This afternoon, we're joined at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies by Bob Wekesa. Bob Wekesa is a good friend of the Africa Center. He is the acting um, director of the Africa Center for the Study of the United States at Witwatersrand University in South Africa. Uh, he's focused on uh, China uh, pretty much for all his uh, professional career. And today we're going to be discussing Chinese disinformation and misinformation practices on the African continent. Welcome, Bob, and thank, uh, we're very glad to have you. Thank you, thank you, Paul, and uh, glad to be here with you. Bob, you were educated in China, you did your master's, you did your PhD in China, you've lived there, uh, you have seen Chinese media practices up front in the People's Republic, you've seen those practices on the African continent. Uh, what can you tell us about Chinese uh, disinformation practices? How prevalent are they on the continent? I, I believe uh, from my research uh, lived experience in China, as well as following uh, up on uh, Chinese media on, uh, in Africa, uh, there's uh, quite a lot of uh, focus on the African continent by these uh, Chinese media. And one has to perhaps distinguish uh, between straight on conventional media practices and those that fit into China's broader global ambitions, which is big power competition, particularly with the reigning power, which is the United States. And in those respects, therefore, Chinese media take on an ideological bend in the sense that there will be some certain media items that are calculated at persuading Africans to take a certain uh, perspective. And um, uh, from uh, years back, China has not in fact hidden the point that this is propaganda. In fact, one of uh, their entities in charge of communication was called the Propaganda Department until only uh, the early 2010s. Uh, it was called propaganda department in uh, very open terms without uh, that being hidden. And, and, and then therefore, uh, to the extent that China is in competition with the US particularly and the rest of the Western world more broadly, there's always um, news items, media items, be they in fact uh, video productions, films, uh, news items on uh, the conventional media and other you know digital platforms that bend towards misinformation Bob that is very interesting and uh, as you were as you were speaking um, it reminded me of this uh, program uh, that uh, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs is hosting currently as we speak uh, a number of uh, journalists from the African continent that have been in China that are covering the two sessions uh, meeting. This is the inaugural meeting of the National People's Congress as well as the uh, uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party uh, consultative, uh, consultative Conference. And they're going to be there for quite a few months, uh, which is quite a, quite a big push uh, by China in that space. Uh, given that, given that um, dynamic, um, what can you tell us about the, the form the form that uh, that uh, that these uh, disinformation practices that you are talking about, um, the forms that it takes uh, on the African continent. I, I think to start with, there's um, particular focus on um, uh, African journalists going to Beijing and other parts of China uh, on uh, these all paid for trips. Um, in the form of exchanges and so forth. And it's actually not just during the two sessions, which happen early in the year, but uh, throughout the year, in fact. Uh, to my recollection, this is a practice that was kicked up and uh, made more prominent from the early 2010s, about 2012, where there's a formal, in fact, this is written in uh, the uh, Forum on China-Africa Cooperation FOCAC Action Plans of 2012 where there's uh, journalists, at least some, uh, sometimes up to 20 of them from various African countries go to Beijing. They are hosted by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And uh, then they go through some kind of uh, cultural education, uh, some uh, kind of exposition 
to Chinese party life, Chinese societies, Chinese food and culture, uh, and you know everything uh, all the way to Chinese soft power, soft power approaches, so Chinese support for Africa, and why China-Africa relations are part of the global South. Uh, and so they are loaded with um, the uh, ideological positions that um, China is pursuing on the African continent. The understanding is that these journalists, selected usually from uh, uh, government media or sometimes the leading private media in the African continent, uh, write back articles uh, or shoot videos or do radio productions uh, while they are there on the ground, but that then they become some kinds of journalistic ambassadors. Uh, for, for Beijing towards the continent, helping build relations back in their newsrooms and persuade uh, their colleagues on the continent to use as much content. For example, Xinhua News Agency content in their media houses, be it uh, print newspapers or digital formats of uh, uh, other forms of media. Yeah. Now, Bob, let me push you a little bit on that. Um, as somebody who experienced uh, Chinese media practices up front uh, and back on the continent. I mean, you were editor of a leading private uh, media house in Kenya, and after that you worked for the state broadcaster. And as I recall, in both these uh, positions, you received uh, quite a number of approaches uh, from the Chinese, uh, specifically relating to, to, uh, to media content, media content agreements and, 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 and so on. Later on, you helped found the China Africa uh, uh, Writers Project, which is looking at uh, covering uh, Chinese media stories, but from, a, from, a, from, an independent, uh, from an independent perspective. Based on that experience, what would you say is the effectiveness or lack thereof over Chinese media and disinformation campaigns. Are they being consumed? Are they being believed? How effective are they? I'll, I'll say the, the effectiveness is actually a mixed picture. Uh, and I'll start with the failure for the resonance of Chinese media on the African continent. Uh, you will recall that most African countries have um, you know, emerged from a colonial experience where they were allied to Western powers. So you think of Kenya and Britain uh, or Cameroon with France or Cote d'Ivoire and so forth. So uh, that uh, the media models that they operate are liberal ones, uh, even if they have their challenges on that front. Now, the Chinese content that comes in is usually very one-sided, always promoting um, the, the Beijing version of uh, global affairs, or uh, relations between countries and so forth. And there are for, for most editors in the newsrooms, that's not the kind of content you'll find in the Daily Monitor uh, or um, uh, Daily Nation or Times newspaper in South Africa. And, and, and therefore there's quite some pushback by editors at that level. Uh, of course, there will be instances where, for example, uh, senior news agency editors or managers will push content to African media to say, can use this story or we are giving you free access to this uh, copy, uh, copy as we call it in journalistic language, uh, or pictures, uh, you know, digital uh, pictures, we can give you a whole tranche of them for your free use. Uh, but then the copy is not usable. Uh, and, and therefore, even if an agreement will have been reached between a Chinese media entity and the top level uh, of an African media house, at the editorial level, be it as with the features editor or news editor or foreign affairs editor, they will, they will find it quite unusable. And in my own case, I do recall very well that we ended up actually rejecting some of those uh, uh, media items and still going with the Associated Press where you pay AP or AFP, uh, you know, Agency French, French Press uh, copy that, or Reuters. Uh, because again, for an African uh, you know, editor, you're looking at believability, uh, authenticity, and tying that to the audience. Uh, where the Chinese media succeeded is where they have bought into African media. A good case in point is the independent online, 
um, or independent uh, group of newspapers which have also gone digital in some respects in South Africa, uh, w where it's understood that they will be actually running with uh, Chinese copy, Chinese content. And, um, but then again, in this particular respect, uh, the independent newspapers, uh, case in point, has not very, done very well in the South African context. In fact, it is thought that uh, because of that, it has actually lost out by a big margin to its major competitor, Arena Holding, Holdings, which is another South African newspaper. Um, I, I think to the extent that um, the Chinese editorial approaches to Africa are coached in the language of do not be critical to African presidents and ministers, uh, do not be critical of uh, the you know, Chinese leaders. Uh, there are certain red lines that you can't cross. You can't be too critical of certain leaders in China and, and so forth. Yet African journalists are at free will to, for example, criticize Joe Biden or um, uh, any other Western leader. It, it becomes quite a challenge to buy into, into that uh, kind of content. And, and for that reason, um, I think to come back to your second point, we established the, you know, the China-Africa reporting project, which we eventually uh, converted to Africa-China reporting project because we, are, we thought we should start with Africa always, uh, in, the, in, the, in line with African agency. After a colleague of ours, a senior colleague, uh, whom many of us uh, actually revere, is uh, Howard French. Uh, he was a correspondent uh, of the Washington Post in Shanghai for a long time and observed up close um, lack of knowledge in the Western world about uh, you know, Chinese activities, projects, and relationships with African countries. Uh, and uh, therefore encouraged us at the University of Witwatersrand to see if we could start a project that will start to debunk some of the myths, look at uh, shedding light, and providing more nuanced, uh, more believable on the ground understanding of, uh, of, of China on the continent, which will be, you know, move, start moving away from certain narratives that uh, Beijing created or promoted by African leaders who are very close allies of, of, of the Chinese. And so the project has been running, still is running. Now, in fact, we have moved on into the digital media space, which is where, in fact, Chinese media also has gone. I mean, um, when you think of China Daily of 10 years ago, it was print. Uh, you'll go to the newsstand and get your copy of the, of the paper. But today it's all digital. Yeah. Right. Bob, during your, your time uh, in, the, uh, in the media space in Kenya, of course, interacting with, uh, with this environment, uh, you know, with the benefits of uh, speaking uh, and working in a Chinese Mandarin, you came up with a very interesting concept, uh, the total state control of information. What did you mean by that? I think that there, there, there are quite a couple of levels or layers to that. Uh, uh, to start with, uh, you realize that uh, we talked earlier about African journalists going on, uh, uh, you know, sponsored exchange programs to China. One of the things that uh, then it will be introduced to them is to understand what can be said about China and what can be said. What would uh, be so-called forbidden uh, is a word that, that is often used, and 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 what, what is what is allowed. And this then will tend to uh, indicate control of information. Uh, and the understanding in uh, in China more broadly is that information is just an asset as a is a, as a resource. It's capital, just the way you have economic uh, assets, buildings, cars, and, uh, you know, machines, and so forth. Information is as well. It is understood that um, uh, China is in an information war, uh, or information warfare with, uh, with the West particularly, uh, and also in Africa in itself. And that um, as in another warfare, information warfare also comes with lots of control. Uh, but Again, uh, there is a sense in which there's an, the, the exporting of the Chinese model of media practices. Um, so much so that, uh, for example, criticism of uh, the CCP, the Communist Party, uh, Party of China in some respect, uh, is not allowed in China and therefore shouldn't be allowed 
in, in, in Africa in a sense. Uh, we've seen, of course, uh, control of the internet. Uh, we all know that certain um, uh, digital or tech companies are not operational in, uh, in China. And, and uh, that control mechanism is sometimes exported to Africa, the African continent in various forms. A like good example being the use of Chinese technologies to control, or sometimes in fact to just knock out the internet, uh, internet blockages, uh, particularly around times when there are controversial political happenings like elections. Um, we've seen uh, situations uh, which have actually been openly reported on, for example, uh, African countries working with Chinese colleagues uh, to look at how to manage the internet in such a way that there aren't informational items that kind of um, affect the relations or are too critical, hypercritical of leaders. And we've seen this in Tanzania. We saw, for example, in Nigeria when uh, uh, former President Muhammad Buhari, Buhari um, you know, banned Twitter. At the point, there was um, quite heavy talk of uh, borrowing from the Chinese model of if you can't in fact control it, it's, it's even beyond control at that point. It is you just uh, eviscerate that. Um, and, and, and in fact, uh, another aspect of the control mechanism will be issues to do around surveillance. I think we have also seen quite a good number of cases in which uh, Chinese uh, technologies might have been used to access information. Uh, I think the famous case is the one at the AU in 2018 that was heavily reported and there are quite a number of others that have been um, um, you know, reported as well. Yeah, yeah. Bob, you've given, us, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking about the Wolf Warrior, the Wolf Warrior diplomats uh, that, have, that have been very active and those Twitter accounts are blowing up now uh, in Africa. Uh, what would you say about resilience? How can media executives, what would be your advice for media executives, young and upcoming journalists uh, and media practitioners, how can they build resilience uh, and at the same time ensure the integrity of the African media space in light of, of all these uh, uh, media, media propaganda and disinformation campaigns that you've been talking about? It's a, that is quite a slippery territory for various reasons. One being that uh, African um, media houses, be they state-owned, uh, you know, sometimes the distinction between state and public is very thin. Many of these uh, media houses are supposed to be public media, but essentially they are controlled by governments um, or private media. Uh, in the digital world, in the tech world, uh, most of these media houses require sophisticated equipment and the technologies are ever evolving. Now China is able to provide some of these technologies and that is usually a key selling point for partnerships between African media establishments and the Chinese out, you know, counterparts. I think a case in point is the mid-2010s, 2015 thereabout, when we had this um, uh, migration from analog to digital broadcasting, which was underwritten largely by the Chinese through loans and so forth. Uh, and, and so that, that being the case, we are very likely to see gadgets like cameras, like uh, production equipment, like OVPs, you know, uh, you know broadcasting vehicles and for, for, for so forth, um, you know, coming more and more from China. Uh, now, I think what is required of Africans and African media practitioners, media owners and so forth, is to be vigilant, to understand that uh, some of these technologies might come with uh, certain technologies that are embedded, and therefore they need to uh, do uh, due diligence uh, so that uh, you, you, the, 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 the equipment and the technologies are not harmful to uh, you know, African audiences or the media houses themselves and so forth. I, th I think another important consideration is uh, continuous, um, uh, you know, education. I think uh, uh, many journalists will have learned their craft in uh, schools of journalism and so forth, but this might be quite dated. Uh, we are now in a digital world where social media plays a crucial role, where technologies are used in invasive ways. And, and therefore, to build resi resilience is to figure out what simple things like what is a bot and how does it work.
uh, what's the role of AI because it's going to artificial intelligence is, is going to increasingly uh, become important and some of those technologies will come from uh, China because China is a very strong country when it comes to some of these technologies um, and, and, and so it, it will be important for continuous education so that media owners, journalists and so forth understand the new media ecology in which we are living in and what it means for the uh, practice of journalism. I think there's no doubt that uh, many of the practicing journalists will be aware of the journalistic principles, uh, you know, ethical reporting, timely reporting, um, you know, lack of, uh, you know, impartiality rather than being partial and so forth, uh, but without really understanding the technologies that might affect that, all that might uh, go down the drain. Uh, and, and I think, um, uh, I think it, will so, uh, it will also be important uh, for partnerships to be created with like-minded uh, media establishments elsewhere in the, in the world. Uh, in the Western world, there's uh, lots of uh, media establishments that still practice journalism by journalistic, non-journalistic um, uh, ethics. And, and, and so that will be important. Yeah. So bottom line is you're optimistic. I, I think I am optimistic, uh, but cautiously. I think one uh, caution has to be exercised here uh, because as I, you know, when uh, responding to this particular question, I started with uh, the cautionary tale of uh, uh, the technologies available in, 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 from the Chinese sources and there is a need. So it becomes a supply demand kind of question. Uh, if there is a demand on this side and it can be supplied, what does that come with? That's where caution has to be exercised. But on the other hand, I think uh, coming from a culture uh, in many African countries where there's crusading advocacy kind of journalism, uh, we can always always be certain that there will be some pushback. And of course, one has also to say Africa is not a country. Uh, uh, Africa is 54 nations, so it also depends with individual country cultures. I think what you might um, see in, uh, let me just uh, throw in here, for example, South Sudan might be quite different from what you see in, say, Zambia uh, right now, or what, you know, the levels at which there can be due diligence in South Africa might uh, be slightly different from Equatorial Guinea, for example. So, so I, I think even um, uh, organizations working on building resilience on the continent also have to be nuanced and understand which country and what are the media ecologies there. Right. Well, Bob, thank you. Thank you very much. This has been, uh, I can assure you, this is not the end of this uh, particular discussion. Uh, we've been talking to Bob Wekesa, uh, the acting director of the uh, Africa Center for the Study of the United States, uh, very well experienced. Uh, working on uh, Chinese media practices in Africa, uh, who's joined us uh, at the Africa Center for this uh, very interesting, lively, and timely discussion. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for having me.